Hi, my name is Alex Cassano and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today we present the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary and the team and the birds, so I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christina. Um, I work at the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary in Indian Shores. I started there a little over a year ago volunteering. Um, and now I do some marketing, fundraising, a little bit of operations work as well. Um, the sanctuary has been around for quite a long time. It became under new management in 2016. So it's been about five years now. Um, it's a beautiful sanctuary. So basically we take in um, injured birds and um, help them rescue, rehab, and release. Uh, the other uh, part of our sanctuary, we have over 100 resident birds that live with us that we take care of every day. Uh, so we feed them and clean out their enclosures and make sure that they're safe and those birds will stay with us uh, for their lifetime. And the, um, one of the other programs we offer is our avian ambassadors and uh, Carol and Bailey are here today. Uh, we brought some birds with us and they're going to go over that in a few minutes. Um, the sanctuary, like I said, has been around um, for a really, really long time. We get phone calls uh, for rescues all the way from Tarpon Springs um, down to uh, Bradenton. So we run uh, basically with a very small staff. The rest is all volunteers and interns, so we rely heavily on them and the public to help us. Uh, the other way that we operate is donation-based only. Uh, so it's really important for the sanctuary to have donations come in, whether it's a food donation or monetary, um, to help us help the birds. So this is our Sybil. She is our red-shouldered hawk. This is one of her first events. These guys are a little bit more high energy than a lot of other birds, so they like more quiet events. Sybil specifically doesn't like a lot of people walking behind her, so she's in her element right now. It's more quiet than usual. Um, but red-shouldered hawks are the most common hawk we get in Florida. Uh, we do get quite a few of them into our hospital, um, mostly due to um, toxicity, so they've been poisoned by rodenticide, secondary poisoning. So they'll eat a rat that hadn't quite died yet or just died and they'll get poisoned as well. But Sybil actually came to us because she was hit by a car. Uh, she broke her right wing and it didn't heal quite right. She actually started to heal before we got to her. So we don't really like re-breaking and resetting bird bones. It causes a lot of stress for them and potentially could kill them. So we tried an alternative method that didn't quite work. So she can't fly well enough to hunt for herself anymore. Um, so she'll be with us for the rest of her life. She is about two years old right now. We only know that because she came to us with her brown diamonds on her chest. And they lose that at about a year old. And then they get this beautiful red. Most of it is usually checkered, like on her belly, but she's just a little bit more gorgeous than your typical red-shouldered hawk. I'm not biased or anything. Um, and Sybil, we know, is female. One, because she did actually lay about five eggs this past year, all unfertile. They can lay eggs um, unfertilized like chickens do. Um, but she's also very large. So in the raptor world, the females are typically larger than males. But Sybil here is actually larger than your typical female. And so hopefully she'll be with us for the next 15 to 20 years in captivity. In the wild, they live about an average of five to 10. They don't have to compete for resources, food or water or shelter or anything like that. So they live a much better life in captivity. These guys in the wild, um, they eat pretty much anything. They're very opportunistic feeders. They live in a riparian habitat, which is wetlands, basically swamp, which is what we have a lot of in Florida. That's why they're so common. And so they'll eat anything from snakes and lizards and fish to rats and mice. Some of their favorites are actually other birds, like blue jays are a lot of their favorites. So much so that blue jays in certain areas have actually learned to mimic red-shouldered hawk calls. They'll mimic the call either to scare the bird away, to warn bird, other birds of the hawk's presence, or even uh, blue jays are actually very smart, so they'll use it to scare away birds from bird feeders and they'll eat all the food for themselves. But she's also missing a toe as well on her right foot. 
um, in the wild, that's not um, too big of a deal as long as it's one of her front toes. She can still perch and grab prey. Um, if it was one of her back toes, that would be a different story. Is she in a cage by herself? She is, yes. Um, most of our ambassadors, with the exception of our screech owls, are all kept separately. Um, red shoulder hawks especially are pretty territorial. You're never going to see more than one in an area at a time. And if you do, they're a mated pair. So my name is Carol. Um, I've been volunteering with the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary since May of 2019. Um, I came down there to actually help train Cypress. Cypress here is our barn owl. So there are actually two different genuses of owls that we have in the world. One is called Bubo, which is what most people see. Or your, it's like your great horned owl or your barn owl, which we actually have here with us today. Um, your eastern screech owl, which is Florida's smallest owl. Um, as well as um, a burrowing owl or maybe the big gray gray owl that lives out west. Um, this bird is in a different species, in a different genus, and it's called Tidos, which actually means heart-shaped face. So if you look at her, you'll notice that she actually does have the heart-shaped face. There are only 22 different species of heart-shaped faced owls in the world. However, the barn owl is the only one that you're going to find in North America. It's also the only one that can boast the fact that it's native to every continent in the world, including most of your major islands, with the exception of Antarctica. So not many birds at all can claim that, but this, the barn owl can. The barn owl is also one of only four species of raptors that you can tell male from female by their feathering. Um, if you notice, she's got a pretty, pretty uh, beige face or a tan face with a cream colored chest and a lot of spots. Um, that is actually what let us know that she was a female. Your males, actually their faces and their bodies are stark white and um, they have very few spots, if any at all. So they're, like I said, as far as if when, you bring the, when we bring the barn owl, barn owl out, you'll notice that he's all gray, and dark, and, and light gray. The males and females look identical to each other, so you can't tell unless you do a DNA test. Um, Cypress here is with us, also because she was hit by a car. She broke her wing right here. This is called the wrist area. And what it did is it actually impacted all of her flight feathers on this side, her primary and secondaries. So when the barn owl flies, they actually have to bring their wings up and over their heads here. She can only extend the wings straight out this way, about halfway. So she no longer has flight. So she'll be with us for the rest of her life. Um, a barn owl's lifespan, actually in the wild, is very short. It's only two to five years. Most of your owl's lifespans, your bigger owls or the buboes, are somewhere between generally 10 and 20 years. But this is two to five. Our last barn owl at the sanctuary did live to be 16 years old. One of the things that, let, or, or sorry, 14 years old. Um, one of the things we have, we don't have at the sanctuary is any predators for the bird. We also give it good food every day. It gets its enclosure clean, gets fresh water, and has medical. So they've got everything to, you know, we have everything there to, to the bird's needs. Um, if you notice, the bird has very long legs. If you look at the hawk over here, you'll notice that this bird's legs and feet are very similar. Where your buboes all are very short-legged with big feet and they have lots of feathering on their feet. Almost looks like fur. She has hardly any. So this bird is actually more hawkish than it would be more owl as, as it is owlish. Sometimes they don't call it a true owl. As far as you bury young, these birds lay anywhere between two and 12 eggs. They can lay anywhere between once a year or up to three times a year. So a female barred owl can basically lay up to 36 eggs. Where your buboes only lay up to three and they only nest once a year. Silly girl. Are they uh, nocturnal? Are Thank you. you. Um, yes, we've all been taught two things, that all, bird, all owls are nocturnal. That is not true. The two owls we brought with us today just happen to be the only two nocturnal owls we have in Florida. And that's the barn owl and the barred owl. The way you can tell whether they're nocturnal or not is by the color of their eyes. 
If you notice, she's got very dark eyes. If you look at a great horned owl, they have yellow eyes or gold eyes. So this bird is nocturnal. The dark eyes let us know that she is nocturnal, where your light-eyed owls are what they call crepuscular or diurnal, meaning that they're like, a, like we are. We like to hunt or eat during the day and sleep at night, which is what they do. The other thing that we've all been taught is that all owls go and they don't. The only owl that actually does that is the great horned owl. This owl screams like someone's ripping a woman's arm literally out of the shoulder socket. So if you're ever in the woods and you hear this gut-wrenching scream, it's the barn owl is what you're hearing. Um, one of the best things about this owl, too, um, and probably one of the most important is what it does for our um, ecosystems and our area. They, these guys eat strictly rodent. There may be an uh, Pacific Island somewhere where they don't have any, and they may have to eat something else, but generally, for the most part, they eat voles, moles, rats, and mice, and in that particular order of preference. Here in Florida, they eat primarily rats and mice. So, with that being said, a female nesting barn owl can actually hunt upwards around 4,000, up to about 4,000 mice or rat a year. A non-nesting female is somewhere between 1 and 2,000. What we've done here in Florida, the Audubon Society actually got a hold of um, our sugarcane plantation owners down in the Everglades. And that's where our major crops are for export. Um, their fields run rampant with rats and mice. They would go up spending thousands of dollars on poison to try and keep them under control, along with traps. So Audubon Everglades was like, hey, listen, let's see if we can bring barn owls in. They like, they eat rodent, um, and they hunt a lot. So as time went on, they had to clean up all the poison out of the fields, blah, blah, blah. And um, they were able to set up a barn owl box, one and they did get barn owls right away. And then and the birds started to hunt. So currently, they just upped their numbers um, and put out a new study as far as what they're doing. So in our fields down there, we now have approximately 3,000 barn owl boxes and the sugarcane plantations. The farmers are no longer using any pesticides at all or traps. And the birds are keeping the rodents more than under control. So the farmers got to put out a, an organic product, which is less cost, much less costly for them because it's the amount of a wood barn owl box. Um, and we as, a, we as humans are getting, we, we're getting an organic product. So the sugar cane that comes out of the Florida fields is, is there is no poison in it. So it was a win-win situation for everybody. And that's pretty much about the barn owl. What about the hen? It doesn't go all the way. Actually, um, it doesn't go all the way. It does go 270 degrees or three quarters of the way around. So from here to here. What's more interesting is the fact that they can stay that way with their head turned and not pass out. If we sat like this for about 10 or 15 minutes, we would pass out from lack of oxygen and blood flow to and from our brain. Their vascular system, when they move their heads, goes with them. So they never ever lose oxygen flow to and from the brain. They also have a packet of air in the back of their head, right about here, that if, say, they get the wind knocked out of them, they actually can pop that open, get the air, fill it up, and they can do this at will. This guy right here is Chino. She is our barred owl. And this is the second largest owl we have in Florida, right behind the great horned owl. It goes great horns, barn owl, barn owl, burrowing owl, and eastern screech owl. And somewhere in the panhandle, the northern sawit owl, depends on who you ask. Um, but Chino is with us because she was hit by a car. She was actually found by some good Samaritans walking down the middle of the road, which is not normal for an owl to do. So Chino um, had a broken, let's see, left wing, I believe? Yes broken left wing, um, pretty badly broken, so his flight is obviously impaired, uh, her flight, sorry. Um, and she actually got some dirt and gravel in her right eye, which caused an infection. 
Um, we did manage to clear the infection, but unfortunately it did leave her blind. Um, if you do take a light to her eye, you will see the pupil is totally open, has almost no reaction to light whatsoever. So, yes, thank you. <laughs> so we actually did recently find out that Chino is a female. Um, like Carol said, there are very few raptors. You can tell the difference, male from female, based on their feathers. And Chino is not one of them. So these guys, you can only tell based on their weight or DNA. And for a while, she was thought to be male because she is a little bit small, but we weighed her at a little over 900 grams recently. And that is well above the maximum of the male weight range. So Chino is a female. Let's see, what can I say about these guys? That is not true about general owls. So Chino is a of the Bubo genus, um, which is um, like your most typical owls, with the exception of the barn owl. He ha or she has short, stumpy legs, very round, beautiful face, and the roundness of their face not only comes from the shape of their head, but the shape of their facial disc as well. So they have very good hearing. Chino's ears are asymmetrical, very easy to see when you're up close. One is a little bit higher on her head and the other is a little bit lower and farther set back. And the shape of the face as well is like a satellite dish. So it is able to catch sound and direct it to their ears. So these guys use their hearing and their sight mostly to hunt. And Chino is also very good at demonstrating how silent owls can be. So they have um, serrated feathers. You can see if you get up close to him or her later. Um, let's give us a demonstration, Gina. Most birds, like the hawk over there, you would be able to hear that. But with owls, they are so silent, they can fly past a microphone and give off almost no sound whatsoever. Are they generally solitary creatures or do they kind of like hang out with their owls? Or the barn owls, or the barred owls, are a little bit more solitary. You will find them like red-shouldered hawks with their mate. Um, they do come back to the same nest almost every year, unless, of course, it is stolen by a great horned owl. So barred owl nests are one of great horned owls' favorite nests to steal. Um, but these guys are quite common in Florida as well. They do share habitat with the red-shouldered hawk. So they live in wooded wetland areas. Um, you do hear these guys a lot more than you'd see them. You take a look at her back here. If she was up against an oak tree, you would not see her. Yes, I also always thought the back of her head looks like a pine cone. So even in a pine tree, maybe she'd blend in. Um, so these guys, since they do share habitat with the red-shouldered hawk, they do also eat almost anything. They're very opportunistic. These guys will hunt in shallow waters for fish as well. They'll eat crayfish, um, small birds. They can eat other screech owls. They are small enough for that. Um, rats and mice, of course. Let's see, Chino here is demonstrating her vulture stance. <laughs> what else can I say? Can they clean themselves? Um, yeah, so these guys do preen themselves like most birds do. They normally cannot get the back of their head, um, but that's what a mate is for. So a mate will preen them on the back of the neck. Um, very unique to the barn owl, actually, is their middle toe has a almost comb-like feature to it. So it's very similar to what you'd find in wading birds. It's actually for them to basically preen themselves of parasites in areas that they can't reach. It's not known why only the barn owl has it. Other owls do not. Um, but again, he can only turn his head 270 degrees. And you can also see that he does have a lot more feathering on his feet than the barn owl does. So I just wanted to reiterate um, our mission at the Seabird Sanctuary of Rescue Rehab Release. Just to kind of give you an idea, last year we had 3,881 birds come to the sanctuary uh, that we were able to successfully rehabilitate about 51% of those. Um, the sanctuary is open every day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. for the public to come visit us at Indian Shores. 
Uh, there's free parking and there's free admission. Uh, we do ask people if they want to bring, um, like I said, some apples or grapes for the birds, uh, blueberries, uh, laundry detergent, or if they just want to donate monetarily, they can. Um, it's right on the beach, so there's a, we have an observation tower. Um, we also do offer tours, so if anyone's inter interested in getting a tour, they can um, go online and um, sign up for a private tour of the sanctuary to give a little bit more information. Uh, the majority of the injuries that we see coming in for our birds and the residents that are there um, are wing injuries, uh, with the pelicans in particular as well. Uh, fishing line is one of the main problems that we have. Uh, fishermen cutting the line instead of reeling in the bird, removing the barb, and then removing the hook itself. Um, that's the best way to um, have a pelican or release a pelican um, and kind of avoid that injury. Um, another injury that we have a lot of the birds coming in is toxicity issues. So everyone knows about the red tide that's been happening um, from probably June to now and will continue throughout the um, summer months for us. So I think about last week we had 40 to 50 cormorants come through our hospital uh, that were exhibiting signs of red tide. The red tide is, uh, takes a long recovery road for the birds, uh, giving them fluids, um, also giving them access to clean fish is something really important. Right now our hospital is filled to the max, so there's very little room left, if none at all. Um, we also had a really big baby bird season this year. Uh, luckily we have a great group of volunteers and interns that help. Uh, we also have a great rescue team that goes out and helps with those baby birds. We always ask people to call us first. Uh, we have a rescue line. You can press one for that and we can direct you what to do if you find a baby bird or an injured bird in general. Um, so if anybody wants to come visit the sanctuary, like I said, we're open every day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I just want to thank the Historical Society for having us today and letting us present and show you our birds. Thank you.